Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, all right. There is coffee in the back. All right. So if you haven't found that yet, you definitely need to. My name is Justin Firesheets. I'm part of the Philo uh, staff team. And so on behalf of Philo, welcome to Philo 2023. Give yourselves a round of applause for making it to Philo this year. This is awesome. And so I need some help from you guys, though, because this is the first time we have ever done an intensive event like this on the front end of the conference, okay? And so after the conference is over, we're going to be sending out emails to everybody with survey links in there. We really need feedback on how this stuff is working because we need to know, did it work this year? Is there something we need to change and do differently for next year? Whatever. So we desperately need your feedback. So please keep that in mind as we go through not only today, but also uh, the, the breakouts that you go to and all that kind of stuff because your feedback helps drive how we do this kind of stuff moving forward. If you have questions on anything Philo related, you can send an email to hello at philo.org and folks from our help team will get that response to you. So if there's something you're you know, not quite sure about or need information about or how does this work, whatever, you can send an email again, hello at philo.org and you can get whatever info you need, okay? We've got the merch out there that you guys walk past on the way in. Uh, you can find the session schedule for today. It's just plastered everywhere with when the first main session is and then the breakout labs that'll come this afternoon. So make sure you have a chance to do that and visit all of the sponsor tables because without our sponsors, none of this is possible. And also speaking of that, let's hear a big round of applause for Clark sponsoring this room and the experience we're about to have today. So thank you to those guys. So they've been a long partner of ours at Philo for several years. And so I'll bring JB up on stage. He's going to introduce kind of the flow of things for this morning. And he'll kind of spearhead things from the, uh, the Clark point of attack. But again, on behalf of Philo, thank you so much for coming out. This is going to be an amazing year, but we can't do it without you guys. So we are here for you. This is all about the tech community. And anything we can do to better serve you, please let us know. But we hope you guys have a great week here in Chicago. And here's JB. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Welcome. How's everybody? Yeah? Whose is their first Philo ever? Wow. Nice. That's a good crew. This is, uh, this is a great event. I'm glad you guys are here. I used to come to this as a church staff member myself. I'm really hoping you guys enjoy it. But again, my name is JB. I'm on the team at Clark. Um, I head up the team that uh, does all the design and the business development here at Clark. And if you don't know who we are, we're a systems integrator. So we help design and install audio, video, and lighting systems for churches and different organizations across the entire U.S. If we can ever be helpful please let us know. Um, a few housekeeping items. So I do have my notes. I got to look at these guys. I apologize. Um, if you did not get a bag over there um, and you were pre-registered for this event, please grab one. Also, there is a raffle ticket where Aaron is back there in the back in the burgundy cert. Um, if you did not get a raffle ticket, make sure you go get one of those now or there will be a break. We'll do a little bathroom and coffee break in about an hour and uh, you can grab one then as well. But uh, there will be a raffle for a an iPad at the end, so uh, please stick around and we'll enjoy. And then lunch at the end as well. I um, uh, just want to say thank you guys for being here. Also want to say thank you to some of our sponsors that helped us, Sony Cameras. Um, they have a booth out there as well, so you can go see them. Fujinon Lenses, Cartoni Tripods and Supports, uh, Ross Video Switching, they're all uh, sponsors that have helped us put this event on. Um, and a little bit about today. Our goal is for you guys to come away with a deeper understanding of networking for AV. They're, we're going to take a deep dive into the basics, what an IP address is, what a subnet mask is, all the way through to how to route Dante and NVX and AV over IP, troubleshooting issues, clocking issues. Clocking is a very big thing you guys want to come away with today, hopefully. Um, so again, the goal is for you guys to, to really take a deep dive and have practical use uh, cases that you can put in implement right away. Um, there's a couple other things they wanted me to say. A um, couple of big things of the two gentlemen here. They're two of my good friends. Uh, they're two team members here from Clark. First one is Alex Stave. He is um, senior consultant and commissioning commissioner at Clark, um, all around guru. He is a recent CCNA specialist, uh, a certified specialist. If you know anything about the Cisco certification, it's basically like becoming a Navy SEAL in networking. <laughs> um, and he, he did that. So it's pretty amazing. Well done. He's a former church production staff member, worked at Eagle Brook uh, up in Minnesota for a number of years. Minnesota, did I say that oh, right? Oh, you betcha. Oh, you oh, betcha. Yeah, oh, you north. betcha. Yeah. Uh, I, luck, 
It's not the Packers. I was going to say the Packers because I used to live in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, uh, I think the most important, though, is he's the 2012 Philo Olympics cable wrapping champion. So he's been coming to Philo for a while. It's a pretty big deal. (laughs) Um, And not to be outdone is Mr. Kyle Goyer. He is the senior control systems designer at Clark. He heads up the team that uh, builds all of our uh, control systems and AV networked systems. So all around smart guy when it comes to networking. Also a former church production member at uh, Fellowship Church in Grapevine, Texas for 10 plus years or so. And um, again, both of them bring their practical knowledge to help you guys hopefully grow and be a little little bit more knowledgeable with networking. Um, I'm going to skip a few things. Again, I think I mentioned in about an hour we're going to take a break. Um, if you guys need to get up, go for it. Do what you got to do. This can be interactive. So if there's a question you're like, uh, I, I need a little bit, raise your hand. They'll repeat the question because we are streaming this, and then we'll answer the question right away. If you don't want to answer, just write it down. We'll have a Q&A at the end, and Q&A and even some hands-on stuff can move into lunch, which will start at about 11.30. There will be lunch in here, and we can keep on answering questions and take deep dives. You guys can come up and see some of the stuff if you need to from there. So without further ado, networking for AV. Thanks, guys. One more super important announcement. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Today's JB's 40th birthday. So yes. please, Badger, be belligerent <laughs> with the old guy comments. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cool. So we're going to get started. I'm glad all you guys are here. Uh, we're going to kind of talk through some of the networking basics, and then we're going to work our way into specific media network protocols. So that's where, in the past, uh, we've used networks on the production side just for basic tasks, for control, um, to see battery status on a wireless mic, things like that. But now we're moving to the point where we're using our production networks to transport service critical things. So whether it's audio, video, lighting, different things like that. Um, We have different media protocols there on the network. And basically, any device that you buy today has a network port on it for control or something. In the past, that's where, um, yeah, it hasn't been critical if that network goes down. But now, as production professionals, we need to know that backside of things as we build stable production systems. And as things move into the future, that's where more and more things are going IP. And basically, everything is moving to be IP. Uh, This is an example of a production truck that I've been working on this summer, where the whole broadcast side is all IP-based, so video, audio, Intercom, everything just lives on an IP network, and you have nodes for that. So that's kind of where we're moving in the future. Um, So it's good to have that base knowledge now for different production things that we do. So in the past, that's where your house IT department has usually managed that network. And that's worked fine, as we just have computers and a couple things here and there to access printers, servers, things like that. Um, But as we started adding these high bandwidth media needs onto the network, Usually, that didn't go so well, adding it to the house IT network. Um, Because on the production side, we have very different needs than your normal IT network side. Um, So we started to kind of take ownership over the production network. And that's where kind of the next step has been that, as a production team, you guys manage your production network. And then we tie in with the house IT department for specific things like internet access, access for streaming, Stuff like that. Um, The last kind of option has been where the production department completely manages the network all the way out to the internet. But that's not very common. Usually, it's kind of that hybrid approach where uh, the production team provides the switches, manages the devices, and then ties in with your IT department. So today, we're going to start kind of talking through our different layers of networking. We're going to talk through basics of how data works on the network. And then we're going to move into Dante. Um, 2110, NDI, things like that. Um, So if you guys have heard different layers of networking, layer one, layer two, layer three, basically that's how you build up your network. So layer one, we're going to talk about the physical layer, and that's your switches, cables, how things connect, fiber, things like that. Layer two is your data link layer, so that's how packets move around your local network. Um, So your MAC address on your devices, things like that. And then layer three is where you get to IP addresses, routing the outside internet, that sort of thing. Um, So it's helpful to understand those layers from a basic level.
Come on, Alex. We're professionals here. Oh, it's missing the clip for the batteries. Yeah. <laughs> the rentals, okay. Try not to hit that so the batteries fall out. So we're going to work our way through. So starting with the basics, switches. Two types of switches that we have for networking. We have an unmanaged switch, and we have a managed switch. So you guys have all used the little throwdown eight port Netgear switch to connect up some devices, configure some things, maybe for your wave system or something like that. Um, they're plug and play. There's no configuration. You don't need to change any settings on it. It works for a small network. But as your network grows, you need more controls and more handles to be able to manage traffic flow and data moving around the network. So we move to a managed switch. And that's where it's more complex, but it gives you the controls that you need to build a large scale stable network on the media side of things. And uh, starting with copper cabling to connect those together, again, Cat5e in the past, Cat6 is kind of the standard today, Cat7, that's where it's all just about bandwidth that you can push down that copper cable. Um, and that also relates to the length of the cable as well. Uh, one just quick note for troubleshooting from the basic level, having a basic continuity tester is key. You can get this at any hardware store just to verify that a cable is fully functional before you start digging into troubleshooting other things. You hit on, you, you mentioned on the last slide mm -hmm. length as well, like the typical standard for, for any category cabling is 100 meters or 330 feet and change, right? So just because a continuity tester will test a cable correctly, and it will pass that test. But that cable may be too long to handle mm -hmm. the bandwidth that you're trying to push through it. So continu continuity testing is great and, and helps us point out probably 90% of our cabling problems. But there could be issues even with a, a passing continuity test. Yeah, yep. And one kind of interesting thing, too, is these thin little cat patch cables that we like to use for a lot of things, because it makes life easier they do reduce your overall cable length from that 330 yep. feet. Um, usually, like a three-foot cable is equal to adding a 12 or 15-foot cable to your overall cable length. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing with copper is that we can send power over the cable. So a lot of the production devices that we use today are PoE, which makes life super easy. You can throw it on an AVIO adapter, plug it in, get power. And the main thing is just to know that you specify a switch that can handle outputting the power that your devices need. And those specs are going to be uh, PoE, PoE+, PoE++, uh, UPoE, and that just determines the wattage that your switch can send to your devices. The next thing that we use is fiber. So fiber has become a lot cheaper to use in the production space. And that's where the advantage of fiber is that the limit of data that we can send down this fiber in theory is unlimited. We're just limited by the technology that we can put on each side. So right now, down a single mode fiber, you can send in theory up to, I think, 30 terabits of data a second, depending on your devices that you have. Um, but in the production world, that's where we're normally sending 10, 20 gigs of data between switches using fiber. And the big benefit is that you can send more data down a fiber cable than you can down a similar copper cable. And your length that you can send that data is a lot longer. So down a single fiber cable, you can send that 30, 40 kilometers, whatever that is in miles, American units. <laughs> Freedom um, units. Or basically a single mode cable, you can send that a lot further. It's a single mode of light that's traveling down the cable. Or multi-mode cable, you can send uh, usually a couple thousand feet with multi-mode cable. Uh, multi-mode cable, the advantage of that is it's cheaper. Uh, you usually use LED optics on each side. Um, but it's not as flexible as single mode fiber. So in facilities, that's where we're normally putting in single mode, because you can send SDI video, data, whatever you want down that cable, and you're future-proofing your facility as you grow by installing fiber connects between places. Yeah, on single mode, uh, you kind of alluded to mm -hmm. this. Single mode is a laser source. Multi-mode is an LED source, typically. And what's cool about single mode is you guys know how like these wireless mics mm -hmm. work. You have different frequencies that these these mics are using the same bit of air to get to the receiver, right? Uh, but they're running on different frequencies. We could do the same thing with single mode and run different frequencies of laser light on top of each other to get multiple channels yep. of, of stream. They call it uh, WDM or DWDM, those kind of things. Yeah, which is super cool, because you can send 10 gigs of data, and then I can add another wavelength to add a SDI stream down that fiber and just keep expanding that. Um, and the way that you connect that to a switch is going to be with what's called a SFP. So switches, for the most part, just have copper or electrical connections to them. 
And then you drop in a SFP module. And you can pick, depending on your switch, depending on, or you can pick your bandwidth for that. So 1 gig, 10 gig, 25 gig, 400 gig, um, depending on what your switch can handle, pop that SFP in. And then you can connect your switches together. And we're going to kind of get into how do you determine bandwidth that you need between switches and stuff like that later on. Uh, so now that we have our switches and our cabling, we want to look at network tech topology of how we connect things up. So in a media network, that's where latency becomes a much bigger deal than a typical IT network. So we are talking about trying to get stuff in sub-millisecond latency for the most part if we can. And each switch hop that we add adds additional latency. It takes time for the packet to go into the switch, process through the switch, and then exit on its way out of the switch. So if we're hopping between six different switches that are daisy chained together, that's going to take a while for that packet to get there. And with audio, that affects your in-ears and things like that. So the normal topology that we do is we, all, we come back to a central switch. Um, so we're no more than two switch hops away from anything in the whole network. So like here at Willow, that's where each one of the rooms here all go back to a central core switch. So you're never more than two hops from any spot. Now we're going to dive into how devices communicate and send packets on that network that we just kind of connected together. So each device that you guys get has a MAC address. You've seen this printed on the label um, or when you look at your network interface. And that's a burned in address on your device. So the first half of that address, we'll look at that. It's a 48-bit hexadecimal number. Uh, so the first half is going to be your manufacturer ID. And that correlates to who made it. There's basically a database of that. So when you scan your network, you can tell what devices are there based on that first half of the MAC address. And then the last half of the MAC address is a unique ID for that device. And at your lowest level, that's how devices communicate on the network, which we'll see in a second, is using their MAC addresses, not necessarily with IP addresses. IP addresses are what we give to devices to have logical names or addresses um, on a network. As we kind of subdivide that network and move things around, we're using IP addresses. So IP addresses are based off of bytes, kind of your basic level of computer talk of you have 0 is off, 1 is on on a byte. So if you think of your old DMX fixtures where you have the dip switches, where you would turn on the different bytes to get your address, it's the same thing with an IP address. So you have four octets, and each octet is eight bits, um, hence the name octet. So in this one, we see we have the 8-bit turned on, and then we have the 64-bit turned on, which equals 72. Um, and that'll kind of make sense. You don't really have to know the details of that, but it helps you understand subnets and things as we move forward in this. So we're going to take a look, quick look at a demo of how stuff moves around on a basic network using MAC addresses and IP addresses. Um, so I'm going to jump over to a demo quick. So on my laptop, that's where I have a simulation set up of a couple computers and a network switch. So when you first connect devices to a network, your devices don't know where other things are on the network. So to move data around, that's where things have to figure out where they are. So my laptop has to figure out where Kyle's laptop is on the network. And an example of that is we're going to send a ping request. So we have this laptop on the left, 10.1.1.2. And I'm going to try and communicate to Kyle's laptop 10.1.1.5. But my laptop has no idea where Kyle's laptop is. So we're going to send a ping, or basically a hello, so to 10.1.1.5. Change that. And we're going to generate a ping packet. So that ping packet is going to go to the switch. The switch hasn't heard anything from Kyle's laptop, so it doesn't know where to send that packet. So it's going to basically send it to every device on the network except for the port that it came in on. And it's saying, hey, who has 10.1.1.5? And the computers at the top and the bottom aren't going to respond to that because they don't have that IP address. And then now the computer on the right side is going to respond and say, hey, I have that IP address, and this is my MAC address. So now our devices are learning the MAC addresses of the other devices on the network, and our switch is building a table of which device has which MAC address, so when a packet comes in, it knows where to forward that packet. So now when we send a packet back and forth, now that the switch has learned where the devices are, that packet is going back and forth directly to that device. And our computer is actually building a table 
of those MAC addresses to IP addresses. So we now know Kyle's laptop has this logical address and it has this physical address. Because um, again, at our lowest level, the switch is using MAC addresses to send data over the network. We're just using IPs as logical addresses to know what the devices are. So in that example, we saw a couple different types of traffic. We saw what's called unicast traffic. And unicast traffic is one to one. So that's point to point. Um, and then we also saw broadcast traffic. So when the switch sent out packets to everything on the network. And with that, we created what's called a broadcast domain. So you guys might have experienced where you have devices that are responding slow on the network, web pages aren't pulling up for control of devices, things like that. And that's usually because there's too much broadcast traffic on the network. And I've walked into churches where they have all of their devices on the same network, um, the same subnet, and your device is trying to process all of these broadcast requests that might not be spec specific to that device, and it gets overloaded because it has to process through all these packets that aren't meant for it before it gets to the packets that it needs. So we're going to kind of work through this um, session and talk about the way that we divide up our network to make it stable with our different media formats. I think, I think it might be worth hitting mm -hmm. on that again for a second. With, with that broadcast traffic, if, you have, if you're saturating your network with too much broadcast traffic, that means literally every device, like this Dante device right here, is receiving all of that broadcast traffic on your network, right? And it has to do the work to figure out what's this packet? Is it for me? No. What's this packet? Is it for me? No. Is this for me? Is this for me? Oh, here's one that's for me. That's audio. Let me use it. Is this for me? No. Is this for me? And that's all your devices on the network are having to do all of that work to figure out all the spam that I'm getting, the spam mail, you know, credit card authorization forms and all the, all the spam mail that you get in, right? It has to sort through all of that, right? So. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to talk about, which is really important for media networks, is a different type of traffic. And that's called multicast traffic. So multicast traffic is one to many. And what we're doing with multicast traffic is it acts like broadcast traffic if we don't have our switches configured to do anything. But then we can configure our switches to manage that traffic so our switch is doling out streams of traffic to devices that need it. Um, so an example of this is you're sending video to every TV in your church. That's where you don't want your video encoder to send a separate stream, video stream, to every single decoder if you have 40, 50 TVs. What's going to happen with multicast traffic is your encoder is going to send that one video stream, and then your switch is going to manage and dole out that traffic to the devices that need it on your network. Because that multicast video stream is going to be a lot of data, which we'll see here in a second. So the way that we manage that multicast traffic is with something called IGMP snooping. And again, that's where we're offloading the workload of routing that traffic onto our managed switches on the network. So in this case, we have IGMP snooping off. And we have a couple encoders. They're each sending 800 megabits of data. And that's where basically our whole network is crashed right now, because we're not managing that. Um, our ports are trying to send 1.6 gigabits of data, but they're only 1 gig ports. And we might have a Sure Wireless mic on here with a 100 megabit port on it. That Sure Wireless, I don't know if you've seen that before, it'll just completely shut off and stop working pretty much because there's too much data. So we turn on what's called IGMP snooping. And then that's where our switch is querying the devices on the network and asking them what they need. And the devices are saying, hey, I want the first stream of color bars. And then the switch is going to send that multicast stream to that decoder. The second decoder is going to say, hey, I want the other test pattern. It's going to get that stream. Last decoder is going to ask for something. It'll get what it needs. And our wireless mic isn't asking for anything, so it's not going to get anything, any of that multicast traffic, and it's going to be fine. It's not going to crash because it's receiving so much data. So now we're starting to manage the data flows on the network, and our switch is building basically a big routing table behind the scenes of what needs to go to what port. So that's how we manage high bandwidth traffic, and that's, again, on your switch side of things, configuring that correctly, which we'll show here in a little bit. So uh, there's a few different IP address ranges that we use to identify traffic. So we have our private IP range, which is what we use internally in our local networks. And then we have multicast IPs, which identify multicast traffic that we talked about to the switch. And we have public IPs, which we don't really use in our uh, local networks. That would be to go to a Google server or something like that. 
Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is how do you logically divide up your IP address ranges? Um, so if you guys have connected to a device, you have your IP address that you put in your laptop, and then you have your subnet mask, which has been confusing as to what that does normally. Um, we also have your router. So we might have a group of IPs for our network at our church. And that's where we're going to subdivide that up into our different networks or subnets for Dante, for lighting, for whatever it might be. And your subnet mask is basically a mask for your device, limiting the range of IP addresses that it can see. So it goes back to that ones and zeros thing that we talked about of turning on and off bits. So a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, that's where we've turned on the bits for the first three octets. So those are not available for us to use in our local network. And we leave open by turning off that last octet, basically all 255 of those addresses to use uh, for IP addresses on our local network. And we can expand or shrink that range as needed. But this is a way that we're limiting what our device can see. And the reason for that is we have the IPs on our local network, but then we also have all the other IPs out on the internet that we can get to or different subnets in our network that are outside of our local network or local broadcast domain. And what happens is if an IP address is outside of the range of our local network, so anything outside of that 255 address range at the end, so in this case it would be 192.168.101.1, now that's where my device knows I need to go to my router in order to get somewhere else on the network, because the router is going to take care of routing it where it needs to go outside of my local network. Um, so an example of that would be we have our two different little networks here, kind of like what we were showing earlier in the demo, where each one of those is a broadcast domain. So that's where broadcast traffic can live. And the other function of a router is that it blocks broadcast and multicast traffic. So it allows us to do one-to-one -one connections but it limits all those spammy requests between our different subnets on our network. So if a computer here in the 192 range needs to talk to a computer in the 172 range, that's where, since it's outside of its subnet, it knows, hey, i got to send this packet to the router to then reach my other subnet. Cool. So how does that apply now to us on the AV side? Um, in the past, kind of the easy way to divide up our networks has been just to build separate networks for everything that we do. It's stable to do it that way. It's easy. Uh, but it's also not very scalable. As you guys add campuses, add rooms, add connectivity, that's where you might have four or five different switches at front of house, because you have your Dante primary, secondary lighting, automation, video, whatever it might be. So what we're doing is we're combining those networks basically onto our production switches, and then we're virtually dividing up our switch into different segments. So we talked about our subnet is our way to divide the way that we program things with IP addresses and the range that I can see. And then our VLAN is our physical way of dividing up our switch. So the ports that you plug that device into um, corresponds to the VLAN that you assign. So on, for example, this switch, we might have the first 12 ports be our Dante device VLAN. And then we might have the next 12 ports be the lighting VLAN. And because we virtually divided those, that's where those devices aren't seeing each other, because we divided up our switch into smaller virtual switches. And then we can take and we can trunk multiple of those VLANs to another switch on the network. So Kyle's going to show how that looks in reality on a switch. And there's some great options for AV-centric switches now that make it super easy. Um, but you can also do this on any switch that you guys have, Cisco, Netgear, whatever. OK. Um, yeah, like Alex said, there's a bunch of manufacturers of switches out there, right? Um, these switches up here are Netgear switches. Um, our partners at Netgear have been kind enough to provide these for, uh, for this demo at Philo. And um, if we have a preference, we tend to use Netgear as a product um, because they've really, of all the manufacturers out there, they've really hammered home on the AV industry, building switches and user interfaces specific to what we do uh, as an industry. That's not saying that Cisco's not good for um, AV networking or Extreme or Aruba or any of the other manufacturers. Um, there are some limitations, but um, yeah, it's just a platform that, that uh, we've come to like, and they work really well in our, in our market, right? Yeah, the main thing is they're easy to use and deploy. Exactly. So, so um, 
What I've got pulled up here is uh, their commissioning or deployment tool called Engage. Um, and you can see here we've got two switches in this, uh, in this site, uh, the stage left and the stage right switch. This could be 100 switches. It could be 200 switches. It could uh, expand as big as, as your network uh, goes, right? So I'm going to jump into one of these switches real quick. And we're going to see in this uh, UI right now, just like Alex said, the first ports 1 through 12 that are blue, that is a VLAN that we've set up that's doing Dante and video traffic that's managing what's up here. And then all the ones in black are just a general data network. Um, in fact, if I scroll down here, we can see uh, this black VLAN is just the default data network. And the blue one is our video with Dante Audio. We've got a couple other VLANs set up, but they're not assigned to any ports. You know, one for Dante Secondary, one for lighting right now. Um, so what if we need to create another network or another subnet? Going over to site settings, I'm going to create a new uh, VLAN. And this is where uh, Netgear has really put in the special sauce for us. Um, in this dropdown, we can s they've built templates for basically any kind of AV networking environment that we need to deploy, right? Do I need a, Don do I need a Dante network? Am I building one for QSIS, AVB? Um, am I doing video, video with Dante? All kinds of stuff. All of those are different settings inside the switch that they've built a pre-built template that automatically deploys them for us. Again, at the end of the day, they're not doing anything different than what we can do on like a Cisco SG switch or something like that. But on a Cisco SG, we need to go in and set all of those settings on all of the switches. This is doing it all for us. So um, let's make a new network. Say we're just doing video only on this network. I'm going to name it Philo Video. And then I need to put a VLAN ID. Um, the, the profile name is just a human readable name for us. It's what do I want to call it so I know what it is, right? It has nothing to do with the configuration or how the switches work. The VLAN ID, though, is extremely important. This is a number from 1 to 9,999. Um, that identifies this VLAN across all of your switches and even across switches to your house IT or any, any other switches you might uh, integrate with, right? Um, we'll get into trunking in a little bit, but this is, this is the number that tells if I have a packet on the VLAN on this switch and I send it to the, the VLAN on this switch, this number needs to match on both VLANs so they figure out that they're sending it to the same uh, VLAN, right? So uh, let's just make this, oops, not a dash, 210. Uh, and then pick a color. Again, the color is just for the, the Netgear UI's visual representation. has nothing to do with actual networking. So I've built this subnet in the site settings. And then again, what's really cool about this engage tool is now if I go back into my devices, go to my stage left switch, scroll down here, this network has already been created on that switch. If I go log into this switch, same thing. We'll see that uh, VLAN has already been created on that switch. But you'll notice in the... Uh, dashboard here at the top, we don't have any ports uh, for that VLAN because we just haven't assigned it yet. So all I got to do is go into Network Profiles, hit Edit, and say I want that network on these four ports. Hit Apply. And now we've built a new video network, uh, video being video over IP. Uh, we built the VLAN, it set up IGMP, it set up QoS, it set up all kinds of settings in the background for us, and we've assigned it to those four physical ports uh, on this switch. So the next step would be, what if I have a device over here that needs to be on that same network? Well, that's easy. Same procedure, just connect to my other switch.
edit. Let's put it on these two ports. Hit apply. And now ports 23 and 24 are on the same VLAN as whatever ports it was on this switch. So if I plug a device in on this switch and those green ports and a device here, they're going to see each other. They're on the same VLAN already. Does that make sense so far? Anybody have any questions so far? Please, if, you, if anything comes up, raise your hand, yell at me, kick and scream, whatever. Um, so the next step is we've created uh, those VLANs. Um, again, this is kind of Netgear magic, but we're going to explain what's happening. It has, that VLAN has to get from one side to the other, right? Um, so there's two kinds of, let's take a step back. There's two kinds of ports. Uh, there's a untagged or access port. That's what the vast majority of, uh, of the ports on the front of a switch are. Those are, we call them access because it's a, a port that a device uses to access the VLAN, right? Um, so just think of it as general, you're plugging in computers, devices, all that kind of stuff. Those are all going into untagged or access ports. And then there's another port, uh, type of port called a trunk port. That is what we're using to connect switches together. And on those trunk ports, let me go back to the other switch because it's smaller and easier to see. This port 29 is the trunk port on this side where this fiber cable is going in. Um, we can see down at the bottom of that list as I hover over there, there's a VLAN ID, and it's got a bunch of VLANs listed. If I go to one of the access ports, like this one that we just set up, remember that 210 number we put in? And it says VLAN ID number 210. It's only got one VLAN assigned to that port. However, with the trunk, I've got all my VLANs assigned to that port. 1, 210, 501, 502, 503. And you can see down in my list of VLANs here, 1, 210, 501, 502, 503. So what's happening there is if I plug something into one of the green ports on VLAN 210, and it needs to get to the switch on the other side, what's happening is the traffic comes in that untagged or access port, and then the switch figures out, I need to send it to the other switch across the trunk. So it tags that packet with the VLAN ID, 210. That's why it's now called a tagged or trunked port. Um, so every bit of traffic that's going across this trunk gets a stamp put on a, the beginning of that packet that identifies this packet is for this VLAN. And then on the other side, that switch is that traffic's coming in reads that tag, goes, this one's for 210, put it on those green ports. This one's for uh, whatever my blue ones are, 501, I think. Put it on the, the blue ports. That's how we're getting traffic between our switches. The only other way to do that would be if I've got one, two, three, if I've got five VLANs on this switch, I would need five untagged access ports between the two switches. So five separate physical cables that would manage all that traffic, right? So the trunk is just allowing us to get all of that data, put it onto one wire instead of individual wires, right? Um, oh, uh, sorry to finish the Netgear thought. Um, in most of the other deployment environments, we would need to set that up manually. We would need to go into that trunk port. After we created the VLAN 210, we need to go into this port and say, uh, tag VLAN 210 onto uh, this port, and then same thing on this switch over here as well. Make sure that we're receiving VLAN 210 on that switch. Um, the thing that Netgear does a little bit differently that's super helpful, you can see in the bottom right corner of that port, uh, it has a letter A. It stands for auto trunk. So Netgear, when you plug in two Netgear switches together, um, they figure out, hey, I'm Netgear, hey, you're Netgear, let's be friends, let's send all of our VLANs between each other, right? Um, so just the act of creating that VLAN, they figured out, we both have a VLAN 210 now, we should share that. 
Um, so I didn't have to go into that port and actually set up that, um, that uh, trunk tagging. One more uh, auto feature that Netgear does as well is something called a lag, link aggregation group. So uh, we're going to get into bandwidth here in a minute, but this is a 10 gig uplink between these two switches. What if I needed more than 10 gigs to get between them? 20, 30, 40, whatever. Uh, you can plug in a second cable and do two 10 gig uplinks to make a 20 gig uplink. And then you use what's called a lag, link aggregation group, to say both of these cables are going to the same place, aggregate their bandwidth together instead of duplicating their bandwidth. Um, so again, uh, Netgear does that automatically for us. If I were to plug in a second uplink between these, it would automatically lag those two together, uh, and then we'd get 20 gigs of, of bandwidth between the two switches. Cool. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is what if I'm what if I get a bunch of Netgear switches and want to add them to existing switches that I may have in the building, right? That are not Netgear, correct. Um the uh, the answer is yes and no. It it can affect it or uh it might be fine. The uh, for instance, when we're, if we have a whole Netgear deployment and we need to, we, at some point we probably need to connect to a house IT network to get internet or the greater production network or access to printers or whatever, right? We need that data onto our network, right? Um, we would do another trunk usually to uh, one of the house, we'll just call it Cisco switches for now. But we would need to go in, since it doesn't automatically do everything, we would need to go into that port, set it up as a trunk port, and then say, I need to receive VLAN number 123, whatever your house IT has created for your uh, general data network, whatever that VLAN ID is in, in, in their Cisco world, we need to say, I need to receive that VLAN ID on this trunk port. And then we can then take that VLAN. now. Take one quick step back. We would need to create, again, this is probably a data network, so it's probably doing printers, internet, things like that. Create a data network, name it house, internet, whatever it is. Gosh, I can't type. Could you flip on the screen? Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Come on, Alex. So I'm just doing the same thing we did a second ago. Created a network, called it house internet, and then this VLAN ID number, I wouldn't make that up. I would need to know what is the VLAN ID that my house IT is using for our general data network, and then absorb that, and then I can uh, redistribute on, on my net here. Does that, does that answer your question? OK. Yeah. I think the biggest thing behind the scenes, all these switches operate the same and use kind of the same protocols and language. Um, there is one thing on the media network side of things that we talked about, IGMP, and that's where between different switch manufacturers you can have issues. So uh, an Arista might not be compatible with a Cisco, might not be compatible with a Netgear on the IGMP side of things. So that's one thing that we found on the media networks. It's best to have switches from the same manufacturer and same line um, for that side of things for your Dante network or video network, um, but you can mix in other switches if needed. We have a question. Yes. Yeah, can you turn any port into a trunk port, or does it only have to be those bigger SFP ports? So you can turn any port into a trunk port. Um, the SFP ports we use because they're higher bandwidth, and usually we're aggregating together all of our other ports to come out that SFP port. That's a great question. Cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yep, so you can customize that after the fact. It, um, Repeat that question if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So he asked, can you customize a Netgear profile after you've created it with kind of their easy to use? Yeah. What, what the Netgear profiles do is they, uh, they go in and set all of the associated settings for you when you create that profile, but they don't lock it into anything. It's just, it can be a starting point. So I can then go 
deeper into the switch UI or the command line and say, I need to change this QoS setting to be different than the template or, or what have you. So yeah, it's more of a, it can be a starting place. Cool. And again, that's where you can do it on Cisco. There's other manufacturers of oh. AV-centric switches. One, one important thing on that, mm -hmm. though, is if you're making changes uh, against a template, you need, you'll have to make that change on all your switches, right? If you, may, if you change uh, IGMP setting on this switch, it will not automatically go and make that change on this switch. You need to do that on a per switch basis. I think yep. that's a good thing Let's to bring follow. up just from the workflow side. Generally, usually you have to go around to every switch and make your changes. It's only certain manufacturers that offer tools that allow you to do deployment of settings to multiple switches at the same time. Need a follow up. What was your question? Um, does the Netgear do stacking like Cisco? Uh, yeah, the question is does the Netgear do stacking? The answer is yes, uh, specifically on the uh, 4300 series that's on this side of the stage, they will stack. Um, I don't know if we'll get into it in this session, but we've actually really stopped stacking switches um, when it comes especially to the Netgear platform. Um, they have a way, the way they do, I'm trying not to dive too deep here. We can definitely talk through this afterwards, but the way they pass data between their switches actually uh, is able to manage the traffic better than stacking does. The disadvantage to stacking is um, effectively when you stack multiple switches, all those switches become the same device, right? They, it's one IP address for all the devices. And what that means is now all of my traffic is shared between all of the devices, no matter if it's going in or out of that switch. Um, so you can, you run the risk of saturating the link between your switches, even if you're not, you don't actually need that data between those switches, right? Um, Netgear has a tool called IGMP Plus that actually, we're gonna do a demo of this in a second, um, that will only send traffic between switches that are that have devices requesting that traffic, so it keeps our uplink speeds down. So, stacking is not wrong by any stretch, but in a lot of the higher bandwidth stuff, we've actually started uh, moving away from doing that. Cool. I think just to touch on again, there's other manufacturers out there. There's Luminix, Pathway, Yamaha makes switches. Um, so there's plenty of different platforms to pick from. What doesn't Yamaha um, make? Motorcycles, speedboats, Cookies. whatever you want. So uh, in the church world, we talked about dividing up our network into our different subnets, uh, which also correlates to your different VLANs. So a way that kind of I found that works well to divide things up, we're going to tie in certain things with our house network that need outside access, but then our streaming media networks are going to be just internal to what we're doing. So that way, if our link goes down with our house, house network, we're just going to lose that outside access. Or if they make changes in their system, our networks that we need for the weekend aren't going to be affected. So a typical setup will have our production device control network. And this will tie in for internet access, server access, things like that. And then I'll usually ask for that to be accessible over the Wi-Fi network in the building and create a hidden SSID for that. So that way, then you can get to your mixer for device control um, from anywhere in the building. Then you'll have your streaming audio, VLAN or subnet. So keep that traffic together. You'll have a lighting subnet in VLAN, keep that traffic contained together. Streaming, that's something where, depending on what you're using, if it's resi, it doesn't really matter as much because it's pretty robust. But other streaming protocols, tie that into the house network and have them prioritize that traffic over everything else in the building so that stays stable. And then the last would be uh, AV over IP if you're doing um, some sort of video encode or decode to distribu distribute video throughout the building. So that's kind of in a production world how you divide that up. So uh, go, can you go back one slide real fast? This also helps to illustrate uh, the question you asked a minute ago is how do I get data to my house network or Cisco, whatever. In this case, we would probably be trunking that production control network and the streaming networks to the house IT because those are internet, again, printers, general data, whatever. We would not trunk the Dante QLAN lighting and AV over IP networks to back to the house because now we're risking saturating their ports for no reason, right? So. Yep. Cool. 
So coordinating with your IT department, there's a few terms to know when you talk with the IT guys, so that way um, they can understand what you guys need for your production network. And the first thing would be your subnet size. So basically letting them know the amount of devices that you need. Do I need addresses for 255, 512? How many devices am I going to have on the network? The next would be the VLANs that you want to tie in. So those are your network segments that you want that communication between. So usually production control, streaming, those are the two that will tie in. Everything else will stay internal. Any routing, so this would be access to the outside internet um, or routing to other VLANs. Generally on the AV side of things, we're not doing a ton of routing between like our audio subnet and our lighting subnet. We wouldn't need or want routing for that. Uh, the last thing would be QoS or traffic priority. And we talked about that for streaming prioritizing things over um, the other traffic in the building. So we're going to take a quick break. Uh, thank you guys for making it through that first part. I know it was a lot of wordy terms on the IT networking side. Death by power. And then <laughs> we're going to focus on yeah production protocols after that. Awesome. It's going to be a quick one, guys. So five minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll kick back here in. There's bathrooms down that way and through the lobby as well. Right at 10 o'clock, we'll start back.
Got it. Hey guys, I think looks like everybody's almost back. I just wanted to kind of kick it back off. Um, we'll kind of this will be the the second half. Kind of first off, how are these guys doing? Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Boo. Mm -hmm. These are true production folk. They're not used to being on stage in front of people, so uh, I think they're doing a Don't pretty like good that. job. But <laughs> thank you again, guys, for being here. Um, there are a number of us from Clark, too, if there's any other questions. Don't ask me about networking. The, the th it goes in the thing, but I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> but audio, I can talk all day. But uh, catch one of us if you guys need anything. And, uh, again, thanks for being here. Happy birthday, JB. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's next? Uh, network media. So talking about different protocols. Ah, uh, yes. The Donternets. Don Donternets, yes. Uh, how many of you guys and gals out there are familiar with Dante? Heard of it? Used it? Awesome. Um, it's probably the most ubiquitous of all our AV transport protocols out there. A, a lot of people use it. A lot of people use it because a lot of manufacturers use it. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute, but there's something like, what was it, 1,500, 1,600? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a ton of options for devices. Devices out there, uh, out there that uh, are Dante compatible. Um, so it's a great uh, system. We use it all the time. Uh, there are strengths and weaknesses to it, uh, like anything. But um, one thing to note with Dante is it is an audio transport only protocol. It cannot modify your audio at all. You can't change level, you can't mix, you can't EQ anything. It's just going to ingest the audio, move it to where you need it, and spit the audio back out, right? Um, and again, like I just said, the reason why it's so interoperable is because so many manufacturers have adopted it. Uh, it is a product from a company called Audinate, you may be familiar with, um, and those manufacturers license that product from Audinate. Um, good thing about that is it's uh, once they've licensed it from Audinate, it's the same Dante everywhere. That's why, generally speaking, barring any sample rate issues, you can send audio from any Dante compatible device to any other Dante compatible device, uh, whether it's a Shure microphone to a Yamaha console, what have you. They've, they're pretty much guaranteed to, uh, to play nice together. So speaking of, we're going to show how Dante works a little bit here. Um, so this is Dante controller. Um, this is live. These are the devices here on this network uh, in front of us. Uh, you can see we've got uh, our NVXs, which are our video transport uh, devices. And then we've got um, some AVIOs, which are, um, if you guys haven't used AVIOs, uh, these things are magic fix-it boxes a lot of times. Super cheap. Um, and then we've also got a QSIS uh, DSP in the rack here with uh, both a 64 channel Dante card as well as software Dante, excuse me, uh, built into it. What's so, the difference between software Dante and the hardware? Um, so QSC, this is kind of a QSC specific, well, yeah, specific to QSC. Uh, a few years ago, they released the ability to license Dante as a software license on your QSC cores, meaning you don't necessarily need the physical Dante card uh, in your DSP anymore. Um, there, there were some cons with that, especially when it's first launched. It, it was not capable of being a clock master and, and some things like that. But uh, as they've uh, revised it, it's gotten a lot more stable. So. Um, we use it a lot now. We didn't when it first came out, but uh, yeah, it's gotten much more stable. Okay. So um, one thing important to note with is how Dante works. Dante routes by channel and device name uh, to uh, channel and device name. So it doesn't do it by IP address. It doesn't do it by MAC address, uh, technically. Um, it's literally the device names that it's looking for. So that also means on a Dante network, we really don't care what devices get what IP addresses. Um, we oftentimes, when we're deploying a Dante, especially a standalone Dante network, 
uh, we literally don't manage it at all. We just let DHCP, which is the, the protocol that hands out IP addresses from uh, your router or switch automatically, um, we let DHCP just hand out addresses to devices and do its thing. Um, and it doesn't matter if that IP address changes. If I unplug something and plug it back in a week later and it gets a new IP address, it, it doesn't matter as long as it's on the, the right network. So you make a route by simply just clicking the cross point like I did there. So I just sent uh, audio from this table mic, I believe two is the one on this side, um, to this AVIO device. So what's coming out of this XLR now is what that mic, what channel one on that mic is picking up. Um, if I go in to illustrate that naming thing, I just opened up that microphone. If I go into device config and change this from table mic two to table mic three, hit apply, we're gonna see a couple of things happen. One, Dante's gotten into a weird state here that it says it's got all, it's routed to something, but it, there's no checkbox here. Something weird is going on here. If I open up this AVIO and reboot it real fast, uh, where's the device config? We're gonna see this AVIO disappear and come back in a second, and it's gonna give us a yellow triangle where that green uh, circle is, and it's basically going to tell us, uh, I don't see a channel one uh, from boardroom table mic two anymore. What happened to that? And then there it is. Good timing. Um, so if I open it up, go to receive and, ho and hover over this yellow thing, it says subscription unresolved. We can see that it is looking for channel one at Boardroom table mic two. So board, that physical device, that table mic, is still there. We haven't rebooted it. We haven't changed its IP address. But I don't have its stream anymore because I've, I've changed the name of the device. If I go back and fix that, change it back to two, we should see pretty quickly that this will go back to a green check mark. There it is, already done. So. Um, that also means, by extension, I could technically take table mic two, unplug it, rename table mic one to table mic two, and that subscription's gonna rejoin, but with a different physical device. That makes sense? So it's a way to, if I needed to replace a device in the fly, especially if we're talking something with a bunch more channels, um, I wouldn't necessarily have to go in and unroute all the sources and then reroute all the new sources, I could literally just name it the same thing. You can't have two things named the same thing on the network at the same time. You need to get rid of the first one or rename the first one. Um, but yeah, it does it all by name, not IP address. And that's kind of what we're hammering home here. Uh, any questions with that so far? Bueller? No? OK. Uh, next, we're going to get into uh, flows and how devices under the hood, what's actually happening here a little bit. So if I go back to my table mic, go to um, create multicast flow. Oh, that's I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Go to view flow information. Uh, you can see out of this mic, we're sending one unicast flow, no multicast flows, for a total of one of two flows. That means I'm sending one stream from this device to one destination. And the total is what's really important. I can only send a maximum of two flows out of this microphone, right? So what does that mean for me? If I send this mic to this other AVIO. Go back and view my flow information. Now I have a total two of two multi or uh, two of two total flows used up. So I'm sending audio to two places. That's great. 
what if I need to send audio to three places? Uh, I don't want to send it to the speaker because that will be feedback. Let's send it here. Uh oh, we got a problem now. So this is going to disappear too fast for me to read. Um, but basically what this is yelling at is saying there's no more flows available from this microphone. I can't send any more audio out of that. Um, take a step back, I kind of skipped over this. What is a flow? A flow is a stream of audio of up to four channels um, between or in or out of any device. So if I send, uh, I can send another channel to this device and it's going to be happy because I'm now sending two channels but in the same audio flow. If I tried to send five channels of audio to that AVIO, which it's not capable of receiving, but uh, then I would run out of flows again because I've used more than four channels. Um, yeah. And this kind of relates back to what we were talking about before with unicast versus multicast traffic of how do you efficiently send that data over the network. So if you guys are using unmanaged switches, that's where it's not good to have a lot of multicast traffic. Um, but and then you can duplicate those flows basically from each device to device. Um, but the most efficient way is to, again, send one flow and then have your switch manage which devices that goes to if you're sending it to a bunch of different places. Yeah, and to that's that. unicast kind of versus multicast. Yep, to that point. Um, so I'm going to use round numbers because I'm really terrible at math. But um, if, a, if an audio stream is one megabit per second of audio, the right now that mic is sending one megabit per second of audio from uh, to this uh, AVIO and it's sending one megabit per second of audio to this AVIO. So leaving that microphone is two megabits per second of the same audio. That makes sense? We're duplicating it at the source. So how do I fix my problem? I need to send it to more than uh, two places. I'll go back into uh, my microphone here. I'll say create a multicast flow. And I'm going to put channels one and two in it because that's all we're using right now. And say create. And basically, as soon as I click on this, we're going to see this problem down here resolve itself. There we go. There it goes. Um, and if I go back to my flow information, you can see now we're sending to three places, but I'm only using one flow instead of what should logically be three flows, right? We're taking that same audio, we've created a multicast flow now, and now my switches are effectively DAing, if you will, that uh, data between devices. And I'm now only sending, if I was sending one megabit per second earlier uh, to device, I'm now only sending one megabit out of the microphone. I've half the, the bandwidth out of that microphone that I was using. We don't really run into issues with bandwidth with Dante very often because it's such a low bandwidth protocol, but illustrating the point here a little bit. Um, the other thing that's happened that we can see is at the bottom of Dante controller, we've got a total down here that tells me in my Dante uh, universe, if you will, domain, my Dante domain, um, I'm using three megabits per second of audio. Um, of multicast audio, which makes sense because one stream is 1.5 megabits per second. Um, let's see. Oh, one other thing I was going to point out, just how fast this happens. Um, this uh, speaker right here is this awesome little PoE speaker that Bob Baker showed me last week that exists, and I'm going to not steal this and take it home with me. Um, but yeah, it's literally just a network cable, power, data, control, everything. Anyway, it's a cool little device. Um, I'm going to send audio from, oh, I didn't, I didn't put up my video, did I? Music now. Yeah, there we go. So this is a uh, coming from an NVX uh, a crush on NVX video over IP encoder in this rack. 
going to a decoder in that rack uh, or on the table uh, and showing video over there. That NVX is also Dante capable, which is this Philo card too. So as soon as I route this, we've got audio on time uh, in a completely separate path from this rack to this rack. These, this speaker and this decoder are not connected to each other in any way, right? They're, it's all on the network. But because we're dealing with two super low latency protocols, Dante and NVX, they're already on time with each other. We don't have to worry about trying to line those up. So, cool. cool. Any questions on Dante so far? Yeah. The video is going across this network. It's getting, it's coming out of this uh, Blackmagic Hyper Deck right here, going HDMI into a um, Crestron NVX encoder card in this uh, card frame, which is then one gigabit, it's moving 800 something megabits per second, um, into an access port here, through the trunk, over to this switch, and now pulled out Again, network and then HDMI to the TV, right? Um, the audio is doing the same path until we get to this uh, switch, and now we're on a different network port for this speaker, right? The audio is actually on the HDMI as well. Uh, if we turn the volume up on the TV, we would hear it. Um, yes? You bet. We're going to get into the questions. Can we talk about clocking? Uh, We're going to dive into that deep here in a second. Our, our, the representative from Minnesota is going to yep. dive deep into oh, yeah. that here I think in a second. Do you want to touch on Dante Secondary? Ah, uh, yes. Right. Dante Secondary. Thank you, Vanna. Uh, one other question? So the, the advantage, well, the question is, yeah, the question is, what's the advantage of using unicast versus multicast in Dante? Basically, we want to minimize, across the board, it's best practice to minimize the amount of multicast and broadcast traffic that you're using on your network. Um, if you can do it unicast, it's more efficient because I'm sending from one place to one place, and nobody else is having to pay attention to that data, right? Um, but we need to use multicast in a situation like what we just did where we ran out of flows and I needed to send that one audio stream to three different places, but my microphone's only capable of two flows, right? So we go to multicast when we need to, in Dante, when we need to effectively DA to more places than I have flows for. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think multicast traffic is more efficient because your device is only sending one stream. But people run into problems because your switches have to be configured correctly to manage that. And if you're using unmanaged switches or things aren't set up correctly, that's where you can run into issues a lot of times oh, we, by doing multicast. Did we skip flows. over that flow graphic? Yeah, we can show that. Go back one more. Um, so this is just a, an image to illustrate the same thing we just did live. So one microphone sending four channels of audio to two, uh, in this case, Dante to analog adapters. So it doesn't matter. But we're sending twice the data out of the microphone to two destinations, and we've maxed out uh, the number of flows that we can send out of that microphone. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see with multicast, we've sent one flow out of the mic, and the switch is DAing it to three destinations. So uh, effectively a third of the bandwidth that um, would be using if we could do that unicast. Do you have a question, too? I <laughs> forgot it, all good. <laughs> um, okay, Dante secondary. So a lot of uh, production devices have more than one Dante port on them, a Dante primary and a Dante secondary port. Uh, what is that port used for? It's used to literally duplicate your Dante network to make it more redundant. Um, but there are some gotchas with it. Um, you could, well, first off, you cannot ever, ever plug the secondary port into the same VLAN 
as Dante primary. It will explode, fire will rain down, death and destruction amongst all the people. <laughs> it will cause a lot of problems. Um, we've never seen that ever happen before, speaking from experience. Um, I've never accidentally done it before, speaking from experience. Um, so the, what that means is secondary needs to be its own network. Now, strictly speaking, that could be its own VLAN, like how we had blue and black and green ports on this switch. We could make one, uh, in this case, color it blue for secondary, red for primary, and run those in parallel on the same network hardware. But we haven't really, at that point, made the network any more redundant. It's the same switches, the same uplinks, the same path all the way to the same destination. The only marginal bit of redundancy we've gained is literally we've, we have two wires from our network switch into our front of house console now instead of one. So it's not that it's wrong, it's just we didn't really gain a whole lot by setting up that whole extra VLAN. So the real way to do Dante secondary is completely duplicated hardware. Um, so at front of house, you need two network switches. On stage, two network switches. Um, in the core, wherever you're aggregating all of those switches together, that you need two core switches to do that if you really want to get, um, if you really want to make it redundant. I mean, if you really, really want to make it redundant, now we're talking, that's two UPSs that we need, one for every, right? Like, how, how bulletproof do you need to make your system is, is really the question when it comes to Dante Secondary. Uh, obviously, when it comes to this Dante's only network, we've effectively doubled the budget that we need uh, in switch hardware. Yeah, JB. Is, uh, is it necessary or required in setting up a system, a Dante system, to have the secondary? No, Don Dante secondary is not required at all. Um, it's literally just if you need it to be more bulletproof and more redundant. Um, we have this conversation a lot with a lot of churches at day one, when we're designing systems together, it's we want duplicates, everything, we want it to be super bulletproof or whatever. And then as you start digging into it and figuring out what the budget, what that means for your actual budget, and you go, I still have one point of failure when the power goes out in the building. Like, what am I, do I need to put my speakers and amplifiers and projectors and LED walls on batteries too? And the answer to that is almost always no. Um, like at some point, you, you can burn so much money doing uh, redundancy that I'd rather just have more lights on stage or a bigger LED wall to put that budget to, right? So not saying Dante Secondary is bad. We do it a lot. Um, but just keep that in mind. It's not as simple as plugging in a, a second cable and, and getting that redundancy. Um, we do have cool. a question out here. Oh, yep, go ahead. It doesn't um, have to be a mirror. Well, um, the, the question is, does it have to be an exact mirror of the Dante primary? The answer is no. And a lot of devices flat out don't have a Dante secondary port on them. You know, these, these microphones have one port. These AVIOs have one port. The speaker has only one port. So um, typically when we're deploying that, it's usually audio consoles, stage racks, wireless microphones, you know, the, the bigger, more higher production uh, devices, right? Uh, the last note I have is um, not all Dante secondary ports are created equal. Um, some devices out of the box, uh, the Dante secondary port is set up as what's called a switched port, which is basically a pass-through. Uh, this is speaking specifically to uh, like Sure QLXD, or ULXD, sorry. Um, they, by default, use that as a port where you can plug in your top ULXD and then daisy chain all the ones below it. If you plug that secondary port in in that mode uh, into your Dante secondary network, it will effectively bridge your primary and secondary networks. And again, death and destruction will rain down upon, <laughs> upon everything, right? Um, so just know that of 
you may have to actually put devices into, uh, sure calls it a redundant mode, right? Yep. Um, versus switch mode for Dante secondary to work. Got a question in the back? So uh, that's a great question. How does it know when something's failed and, and when to switch over, if you will? Um, the audio on Dante Secondary is actually fully running in duplicate with the primary network. When you make a route in Dante Controller, you don't see anything different in Dante Controller other than when you go into the device, you can see that secondary exists. But when you make that route, it's sending audio from uh, the device all the way through the primary network and sending all the way through the secondary network so that uh, the receiving device is receiving both sets of audio at the same time and the receiving card or whatever that end device figures out when I lose that connection to just immediately start pulling audio from that side. It doesn't change, there's no network changes that happen in that failover instance. And it's yeah, immediate. so it's seamless like, when you fail over to the secondary. Uh, sometimes coming back from the secondary to the primary, that's where you can have uh, a little bit of a glitch as it resynchronizes. Yep. Um, no. If secondary, the question is, if secondary fails, does it cause any problems to the primary? Um, the answer to that's no. The primary audio will still be running. Um, but the important thing there is if you are running a primary and secondary network, the only way to know that something has failed, even if the primary failed to a destination, the only way to really know that is in Dante controller. Um, so that's where it's helpful, like your PC at front of house that might have wireless workbench or, uh, you know, waves or whatever might be on uh, your PC next to your audio guy might be worth keeping Dante controller up and running there to, to see, oh, there's a red square. I need to figure out what that was, if anything, and clear that. Um, th on that note, though, Dante controller is not necessary to be running for Dante to work, in case you guys didn't know. It's literally a setup tool um, to make your routes, and then you could close that, disconnect the computer, whatever. All the audio will always uh, stay running. Even if you disconnect a device and reconnect it, like we showed earlier, that device will go, hey, table mic two is back online. Let me get the audio from it. No interaction from Dante controller at all. Cool. So we're going to talk about clocking. Um, oh, sorry, one more oh, question. Sorry. Yep. It's really hard to see up here. No worries. So Dante Video, as far as the ease of use, is similar to NDI. Um, I think it's compressed with Dante Video. There's not too many Dante Video devices on the market yet. AJA just released one. Um, yeah, I think there's literally only two yeah. manufacturers right now. Yep. AJA has one box, yeah. and then Bolin. Yeah, I think not Bolin. Bolin cameras. Not yep. Jeffrey Bolin. Yeah. But Bolin cameras make. Yeah, uh, similar-ish to NDI, but again, it has to exist within that Dante ecosystem. You can't send from a Dante video to an NDI or anything else. So. Yep. Yep. No. Yep. The separate protocols. Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. So we're going to talk about kind of the bane of our existence with media networks, and that's clocking and keeping everything in time. When it works, it works great. But when it doesn't work, that's where you might have multiple clocks on your network. So in a basic setup, we have our leader clock. So usually it might be something like a CL5 will elect as our preferred leader for the network, and then everything else will follow behind that. And in Dante Controller, um, that looks like under our clock status tab, we have our leader, and then every device follows after that. Hey, when Alex, one thing, sorry, mm -hmm. one thing I forgot to mention. At the bottom of Dante Controller, there's those two boxes. One's red, one's green right now. Those are error logs and clocking logs. Just because it's red doesn't mean there's a problem. In fact, when you saw him click on it, uh, it cleared. It's red because it means, hey, something happened, and it's going to stay red until you go acknowledge that something happened. The reason in this case why it's turned red is when I was rebooting devices and whatever. It said, hey, something's offline, or we changed Clockmaster. So yep. 
those those can be super helpful to figure out when you had a, an issue. Also, another reason to keep Dante Controller up and running in a production environment is it will just populate the log when you have clocking issues, and you can go in and figure out, oh, that's my problem device, maybe right yeah. there. So yeah, that's helpful to see kind of history of what's going on. When you first set up your network, um, you can do it two ways. That's where you can have devices elect the best clock on the network, and they use what's called the best master clock algorithm to do that. Or you can assign something a higher priority, where it's going to force itself as the clock master or clock leader on the network. Alex, how yep. much history does that keep? Uh, it's as long as you have Dante Controller open. So if you close it, it's going to reset. Yeah, it's going to restart. Yep. Um, and it will not retroactively log anything if you it's didn't not have pulling it open. information from devices. Yeah. It's just reading stuff live on the network. Um, so in this case, that's where we've elected our DSP as our preferred leader. In your guys' case on your network, that's where you want to elect something that has a good quality clock. So something maybe in your video world where that's tied to your master sync reference generator. Um, you'll want to elect that. And you also want to elect something that's not going to be turning on and off all the time. Because if you have your console that's turning off on and off all the time, that's where if you have other audio in the building that's living on that Dante network, whenever you turn your console on, your console is going to override with its clock, and devices are going to have to drop audio to resync to that clock. So having something that's on all the time is good. Question? Uh, at what point do you go to a standalone clock? Uh, what do you mean by standalone clock as far as? Oh, yep, as far as like a, a separate master clock like Studio Tech or something like that? Or, yeah, so devices natively with Dante can handle a limit of connections. Um, we're maybe 60, 70 connections, I would say, for clocking. Uh, if you get above that, then it's nice to have a standalone unit that can handle more of those clock connections. And we'll kind of talk about that when we dive into the PTP traffic on the network. Also, to answer the question from earlier, how do you see your multicast, or I'm sorry, your multicast, your primary and secondary uh, information what's happening. This is the screen to do that. You can see uh, primary V1, primary V2, and then secondary V1 and V2 will tell you where you've got devices yep. connected. Uh, so when you guys have issues on your network and things aren't locking, you're going to see multiple leaders. And usually that's caused by clocking traffic not getting to all the devices on the network. So things that can cause that are well, actually, it's usually one thing. It's IGMP snooping. We talked about kind of filtering and managing that traffic. So that's a big thing where when you have multiple switches, if you have devices on one switch electing to one thing, devices on another switch electing to another leader clock, it's usually going to be something filtering that clock traffic. And that's where you want to dive in and troubleshoot that. Uh, the other thing that you can look at is your clock status monitor. And with this, we can take a look at our device. So we have our DSP, and we see that that is offset zero because it's the leader clock. There's no offset from the leader since it's leading that. And then we go to an, another one of our devices, uh, MBX card, or maybe something that's on a different switch. Um, we see something that's on a different switch, and we see how that's kind of moved around a little bit. Um, and that's where if you see too much movement on that histogram, that means there's some sort of network delay or jitter in your network. Um, so bandwidth might be congested between switches, things like that, if you see too much variance on that offset time. This so is also why when Alex was talking earlier about the start topology versus daisy chaining switches, the longer, or if you daisy chain whatever, three, four, or five switches down the road, and that, that each getting through each switch takes a matter of time, and you'll see those graphs all start to shift one way because it's taking so much longer to get all the way there and all the way back, right? Yep. And we're dealing not in the realm of milliseconds. We're dealing in the realm of microseconds, yeah. right? So it really matters. So behind that, that's where that technology is used for other media transport protocols as well. So it's called PTP, or precision time protocol, is what's allowing for us to have that clocking in the background. There's two different types of PTP. There's PTP v1, and there's PTP v2. So PTP v1, originally when Oddnate first came out with Dante, that's what they used for their clocking protocol. So in Dante Controller, you might see how there's a v1 tab and a v2 column, or v1 column, v2 column for clocking. Um, PTP v2 added some additional features um, for different clock domains and things like that. And that's where 2110, AS67, QSYS, a lot of those different technologies are built off of PTP v2. 
So the example that I like to use for PTP is kind of this visual example where we have a bunch of metronomes on this floating table that aren't synchronized together. And as you guys fire up your network, that's where your devices, if you have it configured in this way, are electing one device as the main leader clock. And then each of your devices on the network have their own internal clock. So as they boot up, your leader clock is going to send basically sync messages to each of your devices. And your devices are going to send acknowledgments of that to basically calculate the delay on the network. And then all of your device's internal clocks are then going to lock on to the leader clock on the network. And then everything will be in sync, kind of like this floating table metronome. So what does that look like on the PTP side of things? So we have basically the packets that are transversing on the network. We have our leader clock on this side. And then we have our follower that just jumped on the network. So your follower is going to take and receive sync messages from your leader. So now it knows the time that the leader clock has. But it doesn't know how long it took for that data to, tr to transverse the network. So there's some offset in those clocks. Basically, it's receiving that time, but it's receiving that time delayed. So then your device is going to send a delay request over the network to the leader clock. And then the leader clock is going to send back uh, the value of that, of how long it took. Basically, it's time stamping that time it took to transverse over the network, cutting that in half. And now it knows the delay of how long that took. So then it can offset the initial time by that delay. And now everything is synchronized. So can you go back one slide mm -hmm. real fast? So if, as Alex mentioned, on the left side is the leader clock. That leader clock may maybe or probably is a an actual Dante device. In this network right here, that leader clock is the Dante card and that QSIS core. So it means every Dante, every other Dante device on this network is is asking that QSIS Dante card for all of this traffic and it's doing it four times a second? Yeah, it depends on the protocol type. So with Dante, um, I think it's four times so a second for that. That QSIS card has to respond to whatever, 30, 40, 50 devices four times a second. That's a lot of math that it's sitting there doing, in addition to being the Dante card for the QSIS core, right? So this goes back to when, when, when do I need a, a, my own master clock uh, dedicated device on our network? Um, this is where, there's not an exact number for this, unfortunately, but this is where we have to figure that out of how much can the, don the devices on my network handle before they get saturated with too many requests at the same time. Does that make yeah. sense? That's, we'll see that here in a second. Um, so how do you build a stable network for clocking as you grow and build your network bigger and bigger? Uh, there's a few different technologies that have kind of come out over the last couple of years that put that workload onto the network switches. And one of those things is called a transparent clock switch. So a transparent clock switch, what it does is as your pa timing packet comes in to an input port on the switch, it's calculating how long it takes to go through that switch and adding a correction value to that PTP packet. So as you add more and more switches, that latency is compensated for with each hop. Uh, there's another technology, boundary clock switches. This is on larger, large-scale broadcast video networks. That's where your switch is syncing to your leader clock. And then your switch is actually handling all those clock requests for the devices. And this way, you can kind of grow your network however big you want, because you're offloading that workload, basically your leader, to your switch. Now your switch is becoming your leader for all the devices connected to it. And you can keep expanding with that. Um, so one way to view that traffic that I like to use is called PTP Track Count, is a software. So we can see here all of our clocking messages happening on the network. And PTP track count is free for troubleshooting if you guys need it. Um, we can see all of our sync messages, all of our delay requests, things like that. And we can take a look here at some of these. So for example, this is a delay request. We see our PTP packet. We see our correction, because we're using a transparent switch. And that's where we see the switch is correcting 3,500 nanoseconds. So your PTP timing is down to the nanosecond precision with that. Um, so that's why it's critical um, to have transparent switches or things like that that help with that. Um, the other thing we can see here is how basically this packet is requesting our time of day. And then we can look at a response where your leader clock is responding with, hey, this is your time offset. And it always does it from 1970, which I think is 
the start of Unix epoch. Unix time epic time, yeah. Time, whatever that is. I'm an audio guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not a programmer. <laughs> so there's a visualization of that. And then we can also see our devices on the network and how they're syncing together. So we see our kind of devices popping up on here. So we have our two different clock domains existing on the same network. We have PTPv1 with all of our Audinate devices. But then we also have our QSIS core that has some Dante flows going to it. So uh, you can see here it's referencing that it's called a boundary clock. And what a boundary clock does is it's synchronizing two of our different clock domains. It's taking in traffic from PTPv1 from our Dante leader. And then now all the PTPv2 devices are clocking off of that QSIS core. So that's a boundary clock in that setting. Any questions on PTP at all or timing? Cool. Can you go back to the dashboard real fast? This yep. Just a, something interesting to me. You can see, uh, yeah, the, no, the well. dashboard, yep. You can see um, in this total packet count, um, you can actually see how many and how frequently all this clocking traffic is happening on the network. Um, so like the, uh, like the request, since he started running uh, track count, I think at the beginning of this session, there's 71,000 timing requests that have happened just on this little network, right? Um, and you, we're moving, whatever it is, about 40 packets every second um, of clocking traffic back and forth on this network. So it's not a ton of data. It's just a ton of packets uh, that happen constantly all yeah. the time. So again, that's why we talk about segmenting those different broadcast domains. Yeah, you're right. So if this is why we can cause problems going on to other people's networks or combining networks together, right, is we're sending a crap load of packets out there, sorry, to that might spam somebody other switches. And if they're, if they're not handling IGMP, then now that means right now in this little network, we would be broadcasting 40 packets per second to every device on the network. That may be your printers, that may be your Wi-Fi access points, that may be everything. 40 packets per second isn't a huge payload, but it means every device has to 40 times a second say, not for me, not for me, not for me, not for me, right? So that's to, again, hammer home, like managing our broadcast and multicast traffic is really important so that we keep a strong, smooth running network. Yep. Cool. So I think we're going to talk about QoS or how you prioritize things. Ooh, goody. Uh, you switch back to the presentation. Um, so QoS stands for quality of service. It's a um, tool in switches to manage which packets get handed out first. Um, it basically, any, any and every device is capable of tagging packets with what's called a DS, DSCP? D yeah, there's different types of tags. So DSCP is one of them. Um, yeah, DS, it puts a DSCP tag on the front of the packet that identifies it as, um, it doesn't actually assign it a priority. It just identifies it in a different queue. And then in the switches, you can set up, I need any DSCP tag with value 43 or whatever it is. Uh, to be the highest priority to go through my switch. That means when a switch sees a DSCP tag 43 packet come into it, it doesn't stop doing anything else, but it says I need to get that out of my switch first or fastest, right? So the highest queue is the, are those PTP uh, packets, those 40 packets a second that we were seeing move through the network those are the highest priority packets because if those get delayed, it starts jacking up our clock because they're literally down to the microsecond time sensitive uh, to get uh, through our network. Uh, below that are our audio streams. Our audio streams are usually the second most important thing because they're the most sensitive. Uh, they're more sensitive to timing than video is. Um, you know, a standard bit rate for audios was 44,100 times a second, right? For, yeah, yep. 44 one. Um, so we're sending 44,100 samples every second of audio through that network. It could be a lot more than that too. Whereas video, even if we're sending, you know, 
4K 60, we're only sending 60 frames a second. So we have a lot more bandwidth, or a lot more uh, wiggle room 60 times a second than we do 44,000 times a second, right? I think it's important to note too, QoS depends, your setup for that depends on what you have on your network. So you kind of have to build it in relation to that. And that's where those preset profiles make that easy because it's doing all that behind the scenes. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. The, those Netgear profiles, when we set those up, it's doing our QoS tagging for yep. us. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have on QoS. Oh, QoS isn't also necessarily a fix. If your switches are saturated and they're too, they're working too hard, QoS probably is not going to fix your problem. Um, it's more of a tool to make sure, again, everything stays organized and prioritized correctly rather than fixing network problems. Um, same thing goes in Dante controller. I didn't really show this, but there's in devices, there's a latency setting. You can tell devices one millisecond up to five milliseconds, I think. That isn't a tool to fix timing problems. That's a tool for if I do have a situation where I need to daisy chain switches, I need to set my devices up to know that they may be a little more latent than everybody else. Um, it, it's not going to fix a, a timing problem on a, yep. on a bad network. Cool. Uh, next protocol that we're going to touch on briefly, so AVB. Um, AVB came to the market a few years ago, and that's where AVB kind of the selling point of that was you buy an AVB certified switch, you plug in your devices, there's no configuration, it just works. Um, the hard part of that is because you needed those AVB certified switches, that's where not a lot of manufacturers adopted that. There's maybe 14 to 16 products on the market that do that. However, a lot of speaker manufacturers have adopted AVB because of the way AVB works. Um, it's arguably a little bit more accurate than Dante. Um, because we talked about the time it took to transverse through a switch. With the technologies like transparent switches and boundary clock switches, that's kind of gone away. But with AVB by default, that's where every sample is going to be outputted within one unisecond of accuracy. So if you think of a line array where you need everything to come out at the exact same time, uh, that's where AVP is guaranteeing that because it's guaranteeing bandwidth for your audio traffic with your AVB certified switches. Um, and there's a guaranteed max latency. It uses a different type of PTP as well. Um, the downside of that is it's not interoperable with anything else, pretty much. It lives in its own ecosystem. Uh, there's Milan, and that's where with Milan, uh, it's kind of a control and other standard layer on top of AVB. So Milan added uh, protocols for redundancy, things like that. And then um, it also added something called Hive Controller. So to do routing, similar to what you can do with Dante Controller. Uh, AVB is used in some systems, again, speaker manufacturers, and then Avid is a big proponent of AVB with their SXL systems um, are based around their proprietary version of AVB. Cool. Uh, QLAN is kind of QSC's format. Kyle's going to touch on that. Uh, yeah, again, just another audio over Ethernet protocol. Um, it's uh, similar to Dante and, uh, well, not AVB, but it's based around the same transport um, uh, technology, if you will, AES67, but uh, this is specific to QSC devices. It's only used in the QSC environment. Uh, you'll see it a lot to send audio from like a DSP, a QSIS core, to QSIS amplifiers, uh, to and from QSIS IO breakout boxes, uh, all those kind of things. It's proprietary, uh, there are no uh, non-QSC devices that use QLAN. Um, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just it's only used for, for the QSC environment. But uh, AES67, um, again, yet another audio transport protocol. This one's a little different, though. This is a uh, open standard protocol. Um, it is actually the basis of what Dante and QLAN are actually doing. Uh, the audio transport, the actual moving the audio samples from one point to another in both Dante and QLAN are AES67. What Audinate did was put a big wrapper around it for Dante controller, for uh, management, monitoring, uh, uh, security, all that kind of stuff. AES67 has none of that. There's no, there's no controller tool for it. 
There's no management of it. There's no monitoring of it. Um, and there's no security protocols associated with it. Um, but what uh, its weaknesses in that are actually its strength because since it is an open standard and since there's not a bunch of wrappers around it, we can actually use AES67 to get between uh, different audio devices. I can, uh, for instance, if I take again this table microphone, which is a Dante uh, device, and I have a QSIS core over there that does not, if it didn't have a, a Dante card in it, I could put this microphone into AES67 compatibility mode and actually run audio into my QSIS core via AES67 without having to buy a Dante card and all that stuff. The difference is I need to set everything up manually. I need to set a multicast address inside this microphone for AES. I need to, uh, I need to name that stream and then I need to put the exact same name in my AES receiver in the uh, QSIS design, all those kind of things. It's not, there's no like Dante just click and route. Um, you have to manage all that traffic yourself. Um, but it's a good, it can be a really great tool for getting between uh, systems like that. Yeah, it's a great thing for just bridging different worlds to send signals. Okay, AV over IP. Um, this, this is my jam. At some point, JB's gonna have to walk out with a hook and pull me off stage here. That's why I have a microphone. <laughs> yeah, I might turn my mic off. Uh, so AV over IP is, um, it's not a, necessarily a new technology, but it's been emerging in the market for, I don't know, the last five plus years or so. We're basically, think of how Dante works for audio. We can do that same thing for, for video and even USB traffic and, um, and serial control and ethernet, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we can, we can get to the point where we can literally put an encoder on a network somewhere in our building and go put a decoder on the network somewhere else and get that video stream right back out at effectively no latency and no compression. Well, no, it's highly compressed, it, no artifacting. You don't see any of that compression in the video, right? So just the same way we can, we, that Dante kind of changed how we did things. We used to run you know, a 64, 96 channel analog audio snake mm -hmm. from front of house to the stage, right? And then with Dante and the other protocols, we stopped doing that. We're doing network cables or, or fiber or things like that. AV over IP uh, is similar. I don't necessarily need to run uh, SDI or uh, physical cable or individual video streams or video outputs to all my TVs throughout a building. Think of campus like this. I don't know how many hundred TVs they have in this building, but um, we could put all of that on the network and then just put encoders on and send whatever source we want to whatever individual TV we want at any time. Um, so uh, we have an AV over IP system running here. Uh, just go ahead and switch it all. Go to that slide in a second. Um, we're sending right now this Clark logo to both of these uh, displays coming from a um, just a media player in this rack. Again, an NVX encoder card. Um, over this one fiber cable. So we've got four encoders on this side, two decoders on this side. Uh, sending video back and forth across the network. Um, what I want to illustrate here is so this is one of those encoders on port two of this switch. And we can see uh, in this list about halfway down, it says received rate 836 megabits per second. So it's encoding a video up to 4K60 at uh, 836 megabits per second. And then we're sending that stream over the uplink port. Uh, right now it says 700 megabits or 698 megabits per second. Um, these numbers won't quite line up because this is a, these values are a value over time. They're not necessarily a perfect like 
right at this split second, it's sending 700 megabits per second. But uh, you can see we're sending effectively 700 megabits per second over this, uh, this 10 gig fiber. And then if I go to my switch on the other end, Again, this is the switch on this side of the stage. You can see it's ingesting video at that same 700 megabits per second. And then we're spitting that video out on one of these decoders at, again, 700 megabits per second. So we've, we've traced that video from port to trunk to trunk to port and out to, um, out to the display, right? So now, um, Take one step back. We've got more than one encoder on this side of the stage, right? So this one's encoder two, moving 800 megs a second. This one's encoder three, moving 678 megabits per second. That's actually the one we're tuned to right now. And it's a still image. That's why it's slightly lower, I think. Uh, encoder four is not running video. I don't think one is either. No. So those are those both have no effective bandwidth on them. Uh, so we're encoding two streams here, ingesting at 700 megabits per second, ingesting at 800 megabits per second. But notice what we're not doing. We're not sending 1600 megabits per second across this uplink, right? So this other stream that we're not subscribed to right now is coming into the switch, and the switch is figuring out nobody's asking for this, so I'm just going to drop those packets. I'm not going to send them everywhere, right? So if I change one of these TVs to the other stream, I should have, uh, there we go, got video from the other stream. Now, again, remember this is a speed over time, so it's not immediately going to jump up. But we're going to see this port speed start to ramp up to that 1,600 megabits per second. Because now we are sending both of these video streams separately across this network to this side. The tool that made that happen, that figured out who needs this video stream and who doesn't, is IGMP. If we turn IGMP off, you can see we've already jumped up to 900 something. If we turn IGMP off, it will take that 1,600 megabits per second and put it on every single port on that VLAN. And if these are gigabit ports, they cannot accept 1.6 gigabits per second worth of traffic, right? Um, there's 1,200 R uh, now. We're going to see that keep going up to roughly 600, uh, 1,600. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, the other thing we would see if we turn IGMP off is um, these devices, most of these Dante devices are not even gigabit speed devices. They're megabit speed devices because they, they're not even capable of generating a gigabit uh, worth of traffic or dealing with it. So the manufacturers just put a cheaper chipset in there, right? So if we turned IGMP off and we have uh, you know, effectively gigabit speeds worth of video that get flooded to that, these devices would, be, would have 10 times or 20 times the amount of bandwidth that they can even possibly accept. So we would see actually in Dante Controller, um, we would likely see these devices just literally disappear. Um, because they, they, they're, getting, they're getting such a fire hose of data in their face, they can't even get their information back out, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, so we've climbed up 1,400 megabits, 1 1.4 gigabits per second now. Um, but on the receiving end, Excuse me. On the receiving end, we're receiving that 1.4 gigabits per second, but
but our ports are only getting the stream that they asked for. So 797 megs per second and 673 megs per second. IGMP is what is sorting that data and only putting it on the ports that are asking for that data. It is possible to deploy networks without IGMP, like a Dante network, because you have so much overhead and bandwidth. Again, the, a Dante device is sending one meg per second per audio stream, or 1.5 megs per second per audio stream. So if they're megabit devices, effectively, not saying you should do this, effectively I could spam the network with 70 something channels of audio and flood everything, and it would probably still function. Uh, but there become, there's a crossover at some point you get to where you've put so much data on the network that it cannot handle figuring out what belongs to it and what does not, and uh, it'll just fall off the network. Or maybe it may even be intermittent, depending on when you've turned other devices on or off on your network, you know? Oh, it's only broken on Sunday because only on Sunday do they turn those Dante devices on in the kids' building or whatever, right? Um, so those are all symptoms of, of we, we might have a network not quite configured properly, specifically in this case, IGMP. Uh, any questions so far on that? We're using, just for reference, we're using Crestron NVX up here. There's a lot of manufacturers that do this, um, you know, Visionary Solutions. QSIS, or QSC is actually coming out with uh, a bunch of devices as well. They're all doing the same thing, just different, uh, different flavors of it. And they are not compatible. Uh, no, no AV over IP system is compatible with any other AV over IP system. So there's no open standard for that. Cool. Cool. Um, OK, so continuing on the AV over IP stuff, this is it's probably a little tough to read up there on the LED wall, but this is a layout example of a hypothetical AV over IP system, right? On the left, we've got your left. We've got the kids' building, middle's the main building, right's the student building. Um, with, you know, in the kids' building, we might have a couple theaters with ProPresenter or signage sources, whatever, a bunch of displays in the lobby. Same thing in the main and student buildings. Um, because if, if all three of those buildings don't ever need to send audio traffic between, or I mean audio, uh, video streams between each other, then effectively I don't really need much in the way of uplink speed between my switches because I'm not actually sending video between them. However, if I do need to send video, or maybe one day I want to send video, um, we need to make sure we have uplinks in place that are capable of handling however many streams that we put across that uplink. Um, typically, for an AV over IP system, we just treat them as a gigabit per stream instead of dealing this one's 600, that one's 700. If we do the math at a gigabit, it's really easy for my brain to add up ones instead of 763s. Um, so if I put, say, I had five sources in my main building, maybe the auditorium feed, a multi-viewer, a signage input, or a couple signage inputs, um, whatever that I need to be able to send to my other buildings. If I've got five streams, then I would put a 10 gig uplink from that middle switch to the core switch, and then a 10 gig uplink from the core switch to the two uh, uh, kids and student building switches. And that handle, that means I can send all five of those video streams at any time and still have effectively half my bandwidth available for future sources, right? I c if I needed to add another source in the future, I would just add an encoder in the main building, update the programming, and we've got bandwidth to send that. Um, if I had 10 sources, technically a 10 gig uplink would work but I would specify a 20 gig uplink. That's where we get into that lag situation that we talked about way at the beginning. Make that 20 gigs, and now I've kind of future-proofed, if you will, how much bandwidth I can send between the buildings. Um, 
And this effectively becomes a unlimited anything to anywhere system. There's nothing stopping me from routing the ProPresenter computer in the student building to one of the lobby displays in the kids building, other than we just don't give people the button to push it, because if we give them the button, they're going to push it, right? Um, so it, it, it's, you could treat your whole, in this case, your whole network like uh, maybe you have a video router in your, in your control rooms or whatever. Um, it's literally anything to anywhere at any time, right? Um, that's where the horsepower of these systems comes in. And again, the ones we have here, Dante enabled, so I could pull off audio from those, send it into lobby audio systems or uh, multi-purpose rooms, whatever. These encoders and decoders could be a wall plate uh, next to the stage. They could be a source for a wireless presentation device. Um, the other super cool thing about this, these systems is effectively the systems that we use to do all this dis distribution is the exact same hardware that we would use for things like conference rooms and multi-purpose rooms to do uh, video conferencing and all that kind of stuff, right? I would add a Zoom room codec or just a, a PC or a laptop for, uh, to host a Zoom or a Teams or a Google or a Blue Jeans or whatever your, whatever your uh, video conferencing flavor of choice is, right? Um, so we get into systems, uh, the moral of the story here is we get into systems with AV over IP that are not just capable of doing what we need to get done day one, maybe when we you know, open a building or modify a building, whatever, um, but they can grow with us with just by adding the devices in those rooms versus having to forklift out like a whole, if we had a 32 by 32 uh, matrix frame or something like that, we'd be limited to those 32 inputs and outputs. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, NVX is what we just talked through, the demo that we just did here. Also, I think our, yep, our Dante audio has been running this whole time through that same, uh, same platform. Uh, NDI, something a lot of you probably heard about. Uh, you may have dealt with it in ProPresenter, Pro Video Player, maybe some cameras, uh, things like that. It's uh, similar to an AV over IP type uh, setup. It's a video over network, uh, pretty, I would say, high compression, not crazy compression, but uh, it is compressed and um, it depending on how your network is set up, it can also be latent as well. So you may deal with some timing related issues. Like if you're trying to do an all NDI system with cameras to projectors, all that kind of stuff, you may get into that situation where like, you know, the pastor raises his hand and then you see him raise his hand on the screen, right? Like uh, it's, it's not quite as uh, on time as something uncompressed and no latency like uh, SDI or, or baseband. Um, important thing to note on NDI, um, it's not a dig on it, but it's kind of marketed like a just plug it in and it works system. And that may be the case. That may also very much not be the case, depending on it's specific to how your network is built. We're still putting hundreds of, gig of megabits per second of video onto your network with multicast traffic and all that stuff. So if you put it on a network that's already, you know, working as hard as it can work to do what it's going to do, it's probably not going to get there. We may drop packets or we may lose frames, all those kind of things. So um, as it's a great, not dogging on it, it's a great tool, but you still need to have a network that can support it. You can't just plug it in and it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, because most, a the, sorry, the question is, can you bring AV over IP into a pro presenter like, like NDI? Um, the answer to that is is not really, not directly, because every AV over IP product out there is its own island, effectively. 
the Crestron devices don't work with the Visionary Solutions devices that don't work with Wirestorm devices that, right, they're, they're all based on their own uh, protocols. But if we needed to do that, what we would do is basically just decode that, uh, whatever that video source, put one of these decoders uh, in a control room or whatever, and then uh, get out of the way, Matt. I'm she asked a question, man. <laughs> Sorry, Matt's an old buddy of mine. Um, uh, you threw me off, Timmons. Um, we would decode it, put it onto an HDMI, and then either directly run it into ProPresenter that way, or you could then take HDMI and, and if you needed to, encode that to NDI. Uh, so there's ways to make that happen if, if uh, that's a need, yeah. Yeah, effectively, every time you put a box in place, you're going to get some measure of latency. Um, there are, a, in the AV over IP space, there are a lot of manufacturers that have dove, dove in, div, div, sorry, my wife's the, the English major, not me, uh, dive did, there we go, nailed it, um, that have they've gotten into the space and they don't all do things the same way. Um, I can tell you from, just because it's the box we work with the most, NVX, from the time it goes uh, from the HDMI on the encode side through the network to the HDMI on the decode side is nine and a half milliseconds or less, which is less, much less than one frame of video. So if that's why we call it effectively no latency. It is latent, but it's so small that it's imperceptible. You, we're not getting to the point where anybody could tell the difference. So, yeah, NDI is a little more, um, I don't know the, the right word for it. It's, it's not as rigid with the latency, which also is what makes it a little more flexible. Um, so pros and cons, but. You got one up there, Kyle. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of NDI. What are you when you go to your um, the people with the money mm -hmm. and want to ask for this stuff? What is the difference between building an AVOIP that might that will be like more sustainable, maybe uh, scalable later, versus NDI, which is a little bit more like third party, you know, small company, small manufacturer, uh, less expensive kind of thing? My question is, what's the budget difference between finding like a lot of Available things that are NDI versus going the EVOIP route, like long term, short term. Yeah, so the question is what's kind of, to sum it up, how do I figure out what system is best and most cost effective, and how do I tell my leadership this is what I need, even though it's the not, maybe not the cheapest solution? And the, the answer to that is um, uh, I honestly, it's, it's, com it's complicated. Well, it depends on, it, it really depends on. What is, at the end of the day, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? That's how we as Clark approach projects. It's not, I'm not gonna go sell you a bunch of Crestron NVX because it's what we like. We need to go sit down and have a conversation first and figure out what is it that you need to accomplish as a church in your building? And then we're gonna start putting the pieces in place to do that. Yeah. There, uh, <laughs> Bob Baker and I had this conversation at breakfast this morning of, uh, AV over IP versus just sending SDI to all my TVs. SDI to the TVs is cheap. It's one wire to every TV from a router or a DA, and the you know the Black Magic SDI to HDMI boxes are throwaway candy at this point. Like they've gotten so cheap, right? And I think um, one thing to think through with that again, you have these AV protocols that are AV centric, so like NDX and um, NDI and things like that. And then you have broadcast standards that are kind of above that, that add ancillary data, um, precision timing, things like that. So when you're looking at a broadcast video system on a large scale, that's where you're going to kind of shift towards more of those broadcast standards versus the AV standards like NDI or AV over IP or things like that. Right. Um, so there's kind of a difference between those two. So to, to close that loop, it's let's figure out what you need to do in your building and what's the most uh, cost, least expensive right solution, right, JB? Um, so 
SDI is great, it's robust, we know it works, and it's cost effective. What do I lose there? I lose the ability to route anything to anywhere, anytime, right? That may not be an issue for you at all. You may never care that all your lobby TVs are the same video. I never have a use case where I need different things on my lobby TVs. It's great. Then let's build a system that works that way. Or maybe it's, you know, half the time I need this or that, then let's build a system that's flexible to do that. So. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, streaming ACN, Rnet, uh, these are just lighting over Ethernet protocols. Um, don't need to spend a whole lot of time here, but um, it's effectively the same thing as, as kind of doing Dante or, uh, or anything else over the Ethernet. I can send, I don't remember the number, 65,000 universes worth of lighting on a single uh, streaming ACN network. Um, so. If you are built, have, can use 65,000 universes of lighting, call me, I wanna see it, because that's <laughs> incredible. Um, so yeah, you can effectively treat your whole campus as one big lighting network and pull DMX in and out, just like we're doing audio or, or video at this point. So. Cool. Um, I think we just have a couple more slides as we kind of wrap stuff up. You got it. So one last thing I wanna show quick is just how do you, how do you discover devices on a network when you don't know what's there? Um, and that's where there are some uh, network scanning tools. Um, basically, there's different options. I love using iNet for Mac. It's a great tool. Uh, you can scan your network, and basically, it's sending out almost like the ping request that we saw um, to ID the MAC address of devices, which allows you to see who manufactures it. And then you can see your IP address, so it's scanning your local network. Um, Did so we yeah. talk about on MAC addresses the first Yep. The first and yeah, second. So the first okay. half is your manufacturer ID, and that's what these network scanning tools use. Um, so that's one thing that's super helpful. Um, so we talked about a lot of different network protocols and kind of what they do. And I want to touch a little bit on kind of the future of broadcast video over IP. So the cool part with adding basically everything onto an IP network. That's where we can route anything wherever we need to and kind of do whatever we want with it. Originally, with video over IP on the broadcast side, we started with uh, SMPTE 2022-6, which was basically taking an SDI video stream, encapsulating it over IP, and putting it on the network. But it was still kind of a point-to-point -point thing, just like an SDI cable. So now with uh, SMPTE 2110, that's where we're dividing up our video signal into the different essences. So we have our timing payload, we have our uncompressed video, there's a standard for compressed video, uh, AES67 audio, and the ancillary data. So now I can say, hey, I have my broadcast video feed, and I'm going to take my mix from my audio console, bring that in, I'm going to take closed captioning from here, and I'm going to route that out to an endpoint on the system. Um, there's also standards for device discovery and other things on that side of things, um, but that's where these are kind of large-scale, high-bandwidth broadcast video networks. Um, the cool part, though, is that shift of thinking of, in the past, we've had all these little devices to do things in our video system, but now we just converge everything together on a network. We can route anything anywhere. And now we're even starting to virtualize things like multi-views, video switchers, things like that, where we're just spinning up a little Docker container on a server, and then I can route things to that to bring up a multi-view and things like that. So we're moving to this IT infrastructure for the AV, or yeah, broadcast video things that we do, which again allows for anything anywhere, really flexible systems. Alex, um, can you talk about how in the high-end broadcast truck mm -hmm. world this is a thing, but yeah. maybe how, it, how we see this applying to the House of Worship and Church market currently? Yeah, so currently that's where SDI is gonna be around for a while. Um, it's cheap, it's easy, it's robust and reliable, um, but you'll start to see technology um, from large-scale systems trickle down, and we saw that even at NAB this year. Blackmagic released some SMPTE 2110 gateways. 600 bucks, you can get three SDI in, three SDI out. You can control them from their router panels. Um, so it's kind of a cheap way to transport video over a 2110 network. Um, it doesn't deal with any of the orchestration or routing or a lot of the other parts of building a system like that. But again, we're starting to see products now come into the market on that broadcast side for a low price point. Uh, to be clear on that, uh, that is, even if those are HD, those are running 
three gigabits per second per SDI port. So that network port you see on there, you probably can't read it on the LED wall. That's a 10 gig uh, Ethernet port on there. You can't just put that on a regular, regular network, right? So. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's what we have. Uh, cool. Thank you guys for making it through that session. I know it was a lot of acronyms, a lot of kind of boring stuff on the network side. But understanding that allows you to do your job more efficiently and build uh, robust and flexible networks. Cool. I won't talk from behind the TV, <laughs> I guess. Can we give these guys a hand, please? This was a lot. Really awesome, yeah. guys. Thank you, guys. This is the third time I've heard that. I've learned something new every time. I really, really hope you guys have as well. Um, we're basically going to move into a time we've actually got lunch. I think I just saw it maybe show up, um, so I might have to get some direction. They're pointing. Oh, they're setting up back here. So everybody that signed up pre-registered, there should be an individual um, pizza back here for you all. Um, we've got some drinks and stuff associated around here. I think they'll have some at the end of the table. We've got basically the next hour to be in here to eat. Um, we're not going to be up here presenting the whole time. But if you have questions, come ask, ask Alex or Kyle. You can dig in on this a little bit if you want to. And, uh, and we can go from there. In about maybe five or ten minutes, I'll do, once everybody's kind of gotten their pizza, we'll do the, uh, the iPad raffle and giveaway, and we'll go from there. Appreciate you guys being here, and enjoy lunch. Happy birthday, JB. <laughs>